All right, cool. Uh, hey guys, it's me again uh, on stage. Um, so I'm going to be talking about uh, Django, uh, but not just Django today. I'll be talking about quite a few things, including Google Cloud, and then there's a bonus stuff at the at the end of the talk as well. Um, just to kick things off, though, how many people here are using Django? All right, nice. That's a good number of people. Um, so we're going to be introducing, for the rest of you guys, most of it, uh, we'll be introducing a kickoff for Django so you guys can try that out. Um, this is going to be uh, done as a talk today, but uh, in the coming events, keep, in, uh, keep a lookout. I'll be actually doing a full workshop on this so that you can do this uh, hands-on uh, in some of the sessions, but not today. Um, cool. So um, my name is Mashood, as introduced, and I lead the engineering team at sasaticket.pk. Uh, how many people here have heard of Sustaticket? All right, most people, excellent. So Sustaticket is a startup, uh, needs no introduction. We do flights and hotels right now. We're adding some more awesome stuff. Um, and uh, yeah, we're, we're essentially, our whole backend is in Python. So in case you're interested, just reach out. Uh, besides that, I do a lot of community work. With one, of this, uh, one of them is obviously PyCon Pakistan, but I also run Python Karachi. Uh, I help with a lot of other, other communities, including Angular Pakistan, Docker Karachi, GDG Karachi, and React Karachi, all of these awesome communities that we have. So in case you're interested in joining in any of them, uh, you can feel free to follow me. We're sh we have specific pages for each one of them, so you can follow the pages, and we'll be sharing our meetups over there throughout the year. Of the day, what is serverless? How many people here are, have heard of the term serverless? Show of hands. OK, most of you guys have heard of serverless. How many people are using serverless in production? Yeah, I, that's, that's pretty much it. Three people, right? So uh, the question again comes in. Uh, it's meant to be a revolutionary technology that's supposed to remove the requirements for, for having a server. But yet, so few of us are using it. So let's explore that concept first. And then we'll uh, see what comes after that. So the first thing that we want to try to understand is we want to define the problem. What is serverless trying to solve? And essentially, the problem is very simple. The problem is that managing infrastructure, i.e. DevOps, is very hard. Uh, all the way starting from setting up your server, uh, all the way to deploying it on your server, deploying it multiple times, keeping it updated, versioning, scaling. Scaling is especially hard, right? Because uh, you don't know when you have to scale up, scale down, how much, when, what triggers the scaling. There are like in, an infinite number of questions. And I have And running smoothly and we have all seen websites go down even Google sites sometimes go down and that is all part of uh, DevOps sometimes uh, failing on them so the question comes in can we do better as in as a developer do I really need to take care about all of this DevOps stuff do I need to know how to deploy to EC2 do I need to know what CI is do I need to know all of that crap yeah well of course I mean as of right now it's Basic idea is that you take your application, you 
On the host side, uh, if you look at the uh, hosted services, uh, you have a particular environment. You have an environment for Python, for Node, for whatever. And uh, you can essentially run that function there with minimum downtime. So it will create the instance when the function is needed. It will, use the, it will run the function, and then it will delete the instance, right? And because the host is doing this for you, you don't have to manage that. All you have to do is a single command. And boom, you're up there, and then you can throw as much load as you want on it. The, I think uh, by default, uh, AWS Lambda supports up to uh, 1,000 concurrent sessions. Um, so it's, it, it has made it very easy to come, on, uh, to come on and deploy apps and then scale them up without worrying too much about the DevOps part. How do you break it down into small functions, right? It's a, it's a completely different paradigm, and it's very hard to think about. Uh, so we want something that's a bit easier. And that's not it. Function as a service has issues as well. And one of the bigger issues is that you're restricted on the amount of resources that you can run. So one of the big issues is that you have a limited time span within which the function needs to finish. So let's say on AWS, that's 15 minutes. So if it takes more than 15 minutes, your function will simply terminate without finishing, right? So it's not made for long-running uh, computations. Uh, you have restrictions on um, how much RAM you have, and you have restrictions on how much compute power you have, which is simply not the case for a lot of us, right? We don't want to be thinking in the, those terms when we're building our functions. So serverless is very popular, and there are many frameworks that help you build awesome serverless apps. But at the end of the day, the adoption has not been super great. So when we, talk, when we think about how do we fix these issues, though, uh, Google has been working on uh, something called Kubernetes that I mentioned. And very recently, they uh, announced a service called Google Cloud Run. Now, Google Cloud Run is a service that is still in beta. So essentially, you actually need to install beta components for that. Uh, the basic premise over here is trying to fix functions as a service. And they do that by saying that they are making their containers serverless. So rather than making functions serverless, they're making containers serverless. And how do we, how do we create containers? We create containers using Docker. How many people here are using Docker today? Oh, that's a nice show of hands. Uh, so Docker, it was something I was all the libraries on my computer. I use Docker exclusively, including for Python. I just uh, spin up a container when I need it, and, and when I'm done. Um, the basic goal over here is to isolate your application environment. The way this used to happen was, before we used to create something called VMs, right? And VMs was a full copy of your operating system and all of the application code and all of your binaries all combined into this one thing. And it was a pretty thick layer. And you would run that on top of a host OS. It was another layer. So moving the, moving the VMs and then running them was extremely resource heavy. What Docker does is it removes the need for your basic base OS on every container. It creates this minimal binary that essentially can be as small as 5 MB. Uh, Linux Alpine is a container that's just 5 MB, and you can run a Linux kernel in that. Uh, and it makes it super fast to spin it up and spin it down again, right? So containers have really changed of how we think about development. And then we took it one step forward, and we automated those containers using this uh, tool called Kubernetes. Um, now, Kubernetes is Google-backed, and it, now it's part of the Open, uh, open Source Foundation. Uh, and its basic idea is to take your container and run it in production, right? So as I mentioned before, it requires, it has a setup cost. And then once it's set up, it's pretty much automated. You're continuously pushing stuff on Kubernetes, and it will scale up and it'll scale down. It will make sure it, will, it has built-in monitoring. It, ha it has built-in logging. It has many plugins that automate a lot of the stuff 
that we now do manually today. So when Google launched Kubernetes, they kept thinking about, OK, fine, Google, Kubernetes is awesome. Everyone's using it. We have Kubernetes on Amazon. We have Kubernetes on IBM. We have, Google, obviously, on Google Cloud. But we have this barrier to entry. People have to understand Kubernetes in order to start using it. What if we were to remove this barrier completely? And that's where the concept of Google Cloud Run comes in. Google Cloud Run essentially does that small extension over the Kubernetes structure and just creates those configurations for you. It creates that managed platform for you. It manages your Kubernetes configuration and uh, helps you just deploy within seconds in a production environment. And when I'm talking about production environment, it's not just a single EC2 instance. It's an instance that is stable. It has availability in multiple zones. It has uh, essentially scalability built in so that Whenever uh, there is more load, it will add more containers to it and ensure your application keeps running smoothly uh, throughout its time. So, so besides that, why else would you use uh, Google Cloud Run? And uh, I've listed a few things over here. Uh, one of the bigger things, again, with containers, you're not thinking about functions. You're thinking about just your code, as is. You if you have a monolith application, Nobody cares. You can take that. You can deploy it as a single container. You can put it on Google Cloud Run. That's not a problem. If you have microservices, no problem. Set up your containers and deploy them, and it will run them as well, right? So container can run any language, any framework, anything that you really want. And you can then deploy it on Google Cloud Run without changing any major part of your application source code. And then, obviously, uh, the good part is that it takes takes care of everything that's related within the uh, DevOps ecosystem. And that includes logging and monitoring. That is so important to us when we're running in production. So in order to give you a sense of what the power of uh, Google Cloud Run, uh, we're going to run through building a very simple Django application. It's completely trivial, one endpoint. We will deploy that application using Cloud Run. And uh, then we'll do some more stuff afterwards. So for those of you who are acquainted with the Python ecosystem, this looks familiar. Uh, we're installing Django and the Django REST framework. Um, we're going to use the Django admin command to scaffold our base. Uh, and then we're going to move on to uh, essentially configuring our library inside the settings file. right? Uh, just doing these three things, that takes less than five minutes, by the way, uh, gets you set up for making a REST API in Django. That's all you have to do. It literally takes five minutes. Uh, next up, you want to create some stuff. Let's create an endpoint. The first thing we want to create is the endpoint itself, what is happening over there. Um, so over here, we've created a hello world endpoint. That's, again, very trivial. And that's just going to re return some text of hello world uh, from Django. We want to configure the URL where, when, when are we going to hit this, uh, uh, where are we going to hit this uh, endpoint. For that, I've created a path, hello underscore world, and I've linked it to my view. Really straightforward. This is uh, very readable. You don't have to think about, oh, what's really happening here. Um, so this is one of the beauties of using Python and Django as well. Uh, next are some mandatory commands that we have to run. You first have to. Uh, create uh, a default database using um, um, your migrate command, and then you just run the server. And now you have the server running locally on your machine. And you can hit the endpoint, and it's going to work fine, and you've created your first Django app. And uh, if this is your first time, this should not take more than 20 minutes. So I would encourage everyone here to try it out, at least. Uh, it's super, super easy. So now that we've created uh, our Django app. And right now, it's just a Django app, normal, nothing special over here. I want to containerize this Django app so I can deploy it on Google Cloud Run. So in order to containerize an application, we create something called a Docker file for that application. Now, all, Docker, all the Docker file is is a set of configurations. It contains how do you build this image, what kind of environment is needed to run your application. And that's why, when you look at it, it there's nothing new here. You must, you're probably working with these commands on a daily basis, right? 
Um, so essentially, we're starting from a Python 3.6 image. So this is one of the cool things about uh, containers. You can layer them up. And we're starting from a very high layer. So I don't have to start from a Linux layer. I can start from a Python layer and build on top of that. And that kind of makes it very easy for me to go to the next level. Uh, I've uh, run some basic setup commands, uh, installed some bit, uh, build essential uh, tooling for my app. I've set my work directory. I've copied all my files that are of the API into the image, yeah, because I want to be available. I want them to be part of the image when I deploy it on Google Cloud Run, and then I simply run the same commands that I ran. Before. Requirements that will install on my uh, Django and REST framework. I will migrate and then I will run server. Now, I will add a note over here that normally this is not how I would deploy this in production. Uh, managed serv run server is meant to be used as a local tool. Uh, we usually use something like GUnicorn when you're running in production, but that's just a few more lines of code, right? It's still pretty straightforward. So now you have containerized the application. The only thing left is to deploy it on Google Cloud Run. So the first thing you want to do is you want to go up and sign up for GCP. That's very straightforward. Uh, once you're in, you want to open up Google Cloud Run and enable, some, enable the API. Uh, so you can see the button on top where it says Disable API. It will be Enable API for you guys. And once you've enabled that, uh, you're done with the setup part. We move to your computer. We install the Google Cloud SDK on your machine. Uh, over here, I'm running install manually. If you're on a Mac, you can use Brew. If you're on Linux, uh, there are other ways of doing it. So whatever is easy for you guys, you can use that. Uh, you will use the gcloud init command to log in and configure your project. Again, non-trivial. Uh, then you'll install the beta components. And this is where normally, if you want to use a gcloud component, you don't have to install anything else. But in this case, since this is beta for now, we need to do this additional step. And that will install the Cloud Run component for uh, the deployment. The final two commands are the actual deployment thing that I have to do in order to deploy to Google Cloud Run. The first one is, obviously, I need to build the image and push it to GCR, Google Cloud Repository. So all images are stored in a repository. And whenever I want to run them, I take the image, and then I execute it in the environment space. So the first command builds the image and submits it to the repository with the gcr.io slash mashudar slash hello world. That's the name of my repository. And then all I have to do is, I have to say beta run deploy, and it will take that image and deploy it in production in Google Cloud Run. And you'll notice the platform managed. That's where I tell Google that I don't want to configure Kubernetes. It's up to you how you do it. It's up to you for how you want to scale this. Uh, just figure this out for me and make sure it's up and running in a few seconds. And when you run this command, at the end of this, you will get your URL where this deployment is now running, and that was it. You're now live in production, right? So, and then next time onwards, whenever you want to deploy, it's going to be the same two commands, right? You will essentially build another Docker image, and then you will ship it over, and then you will deploy that separately to the production environment. So now that we've deployed it to production, for me, a thing is not production ready until it's fully automated. I believe strongly in continuous integration. How many people have heard of continuous integration over here? OK, excellent, many people, right? So uh, nowadays, one of the main uh, things that everyone would have noticed here that we're always moving very fast. We're building products, we're building features every day, every week. We want to ship continuously, right? So there is no margin here for deploying stuff manually every week. In fact, if you want deploying daily, it's not even possible to do that daily because you have to run commands, you have to run updates. It's, you're going to make a mistake somewhere. So I'm always looking for the best way to automate. And before this, before everything else, we used to have Jenkins. Uh, that was the popular tool. Nowadays, I'm using Travis.ci and Circle.ci to automate, which is, all, again, very similar. But recently, there has been something very new and something very exciting that you may have heard of called GitHub Actions. How many people have heard of GitHub Actions here? OK, very few. And this is a very, very new uh, feature uh, by GitHub. It's still in beta again. So this is completely high tech. And most of you might not even have access to this. You have to request access. And I was uh, lucky that I got access early on. So I thought, you know what? Let's try this. 
So essentially, if you've used Travis.ci or CircleCI, it's very similar in that sense. You have uh, effectively uh, a config file that you can configure, and uh, that config file will have all the instructions of how you want to run and what you want to run in order to make the build or test the build or do whatever you want, effectively. You could just do a, a, a hello world and end it. In this particular case, whenever I want to push to master my master branch, I want to deploy a new version of my app. And I don't want to think about it. I just merge the PR and it should happen automatically. And when it's done, it should just send me an email, right? So the steps that we want to follow is, first thing, we want to obviously authenticate to Google Cloud in order to deploy it. We will then uh, build the image, and we will upload the image, and then we'll deploy the code. These are the four things that we did on our local machine. The only difference is now we're done, doing them on some, on, on some server in the cloud, right? And it's all happening automatically, and it's all getting deployed all the time. There's a tutorial link over here for those of you who want to follow this later on. So let's look at this YAML file. This is a pretty big YAML file, so I've broken it down over uh, a few slides, and I'm going to run it step by step on what's happening where. So this is a start. Uh, YAML is a type of configuration file, and as you can see, this is the layout, this is the format of the file. Uh, we've started with naming the task, and you can have multiple tasks doing different things. So you can have a task for making sure that you have uh, the static build uh, analysis is happening, you can have a separate task for tests, and you can have a separate task for something else. Um, and you can configure each one differently. And on this particular one, I've asked, uh, whenever I push to master, so normally our workflow is the git flow, so I, I'll branch out from master, I'll create a branch, uh, I'll work on it, I'll push it, create a PR, and then merge the PR back into master. So whenever I've merged something into master, that means I'm ready for it to be deployed to production. So in this case, I should run my script and deploy it to production. So now I have the jobs, and in these jobs, I have uh, my first job called deploy, and that's going to run on Ubuntu latest. Now again, you have different containers that you can base it on. So let's say you want a container that uh, you want you have a very specific environment. Uh, maybe it's a very specific uh, data science tool that needs a very specific environment. You can start from that container instead of running it on Ubuntu, right? Otherwise, you'll have to do an additional setup. This kind of helps you reduce that setup for yourself. The first step is just a simple checkout step. So we have predefined actions within GitHub Action. They're, these are like small libraries or plugins, right? You can just use these in this code here, and we'll see that in a second. So in order to authenticate to GCP, which I thought would be very hard because, you know, I'm giving them access to my cloud, uh, actually it's sim pretty simple. I have to export my secret from the Google Cloud server. It's a, it's a JSON file. I have to convert that into Base64, go into settings, and create a secret over there called gcloud.auth, and I could obviously name it anything I want. And then I just simply just use it over here, and I use it inside this plugin, actions slash gcloud slash auth. So all the hard work that I did before on my local machine has already been done. I don't have to install the Google SDK, I don't have to configure the Google SDK, I don't have to do anything. It's already configured, I just have to write these four lines of code, and I'm authenticated on Google Cloud. Next up, let's build the image. So that's very straightforward. Uh, we have a Docker build command, and I'm going to use the Docker build command to create the image. And notice that I'm actually using uh, secrets.project and secrets.app name. So I'm not using the app name insi inside my YAML file. And the reason I'm doing this is because it makes my script reusable, right? So when I wanted to actually use this in my actual, so this is a demo, uh, when I actually wanted to use it in my actual app, I simply just copy pasted the config into this and it still worked. Why? Because all of the variables were coming from the secrets, right? So I went in the settings and configured the secrets in that repository separately. So the project name and app comes, comes from there. I configured Docker, so inside the plugin, I tell it that, hey, look, I'm using Docker as my containerization tool. That's very straightforward, just another command. Next step is pushing the uh, image to Google, Google Cloud Run, and over here, uh, you, you can notice we're running a slightly different command. And uh, that's again because it's a different environment, we're configured it differently, we're using Docker push to do the exact same place, gcr.io slash mashudar slash hello world to that same image. And finally, we are going to deploy to Google Cloud Run. 
And again, it's the same command, just looking slightly differently. I first install the beta components, and then I run gcloud uh, deploy. And uh, we have a few more parameters here. And again, you have to do this because you're running in the cloud. It's not your local environment. This is not configured. This is going to be a new instance every time you run this script, right? So you have to make sure everything is configured properly. So you'll see things like the region configured, the, na the project name configured, stuff like this we didn't configure when we were doing it locally. But we do still have the platform managed at the end that ensures that this gets deployed to uh, the managed service when we do that. And then we push to master. And we cross our fingers. Uh, you're going to fail a few times, definitely, right? But eventually, you'll get it to pass. And when you get it to pass, you, you have realized that every time you push to master, you will have a new version running in the cloud automatically without you doing anything. And it's going to show up over here under the Actions tab inside GitHub. And you can go and check the logs over here. Every time it fails, it's going to send you an email. Every time it's success, it's going to send you an email. This is a super awesome tool that is right now built into uh, GitHub. And at the moment, it's free, so definitely worth checking out. Uh, there are many, many use cases for this. And this is just one very simple example that I've shared with you today. If you click on the task, you can see its details, all of the steps that we ran. And you can open up each step and see what was the logs from that step. And if anything failed, you can debug using that. So as a summary, what did we do today? We created a single API using Django. I hope you guys will try that today. Uh, set up Docker for the project so that it is now containerized. We then set up gcloud CLI on our machines. And that was just for a local deployment. Then we deployed the code to Google Cloud Run. And finally, we automated the whole process using GitHub Actions. And, uh, all of this is now configured, so if you were literally call, uh, uh, following the tutorial, this shouldn't be taking you more than an hour to complete, right? So this is very simple things that you can use, and this is really cutting edge uh, that you can use to effectively get that additional boost uh, rather than managing all the services and servers. So we right now, as I said again, we're using this for uh, our dev tooling. We have many uh, small things running on different servers. So instead of uh, running EC2 instances and deploying them and managing them, we've simply automated the complete repository setup um, for this. And we're just running these. And the best part is, obviously, serverless is that um, you only get charged for when it's running. When it's not running, you don't get charged, so you save a lot as well. That was it from my side. Uh, thank you all very much. And I hope you have a lot of questions. I'll be downstairs during lunch. Uh, feel free to reach out to me and uh, ask me any questions.